Uh, Coach Benedict Matherin uh, won uh, Pac-12 Freshman of the Week. Uh, what did you think about just the week he had in winning this award? Against Washington State was a big reason we were able to win. Uh, he was terrific. One of the statistics that he uh, checked the box with was his rebounding. You know, he had 11 rebounds after halftime in the Washington State game. And we need, we not only needed his points, which – Obviously, that speaks for itself. But the 11 rebounds plus the 20-plus points, uh, it was an outstanding game. He was the best player on the court for us. And um, I'm really happy for him that he won the Pac-12 Rookie of the Week because uh, his level of play certainly earned it. But when you see a young player play that way in a pivotal game in which the outcome could go either way, that's really when you want him rewarded. and. Uh, very timely performance by Ben. Ryan Kellapier, you're next. Uh, yeah, so this is your best offensive rebounding team, at least on a percentage basis. I'm just curious how much you attribute that to personnel and, and how much of that is intangibles like effort or, or having a nose for the ball and things like that. Well, everything starts with personnel. You know, the talent level, the experience level of the team that we have. But, you know, I've mentioned this a uh, number of different times. One of our, our strengths at the moment is our depth. Hopefully we can continue having it. But, you know, we don't start Ira Lee and Christian Coloco yet. Both of those uh, young guys are uh, very, very pivotal towards our team's overall success. You know, Christian is our best front court defender, an excellent rebounder. You mentioned offensive rebounder. Ira Lee uh, does a lot of different things, plays a great effort and energy, very talented offensive rebounder. And uh, Ben, you know, who we don't start off the bench. Uh, those are three guys that don't start that have really contributed uh, in our rebounding efforts. Uh, obviously, the starters, Jordan Brown and Azulis and Dalen Terry, you know, now I've named six guys. So we have the personnel to be able to do it. I think it really helps both our defense and our offense. And, you know, when you have strengths, you have to be able to uh, get some outcome from the games. And uh, so far, we've done a good job rebounding, and this week will be our biggest test thus far. And how, and how uh, like, much of your success do you think is because of your rebounding and how you're able to create extra possessions? Well, it's a big part of our offense. Uh, it's made up at times for uh, when we've turned the ball over too much. Uh, it's made up for times when maybe we haven't shot the ball well from the free throw line or even the field. But key second shots, you know, you get a second shot, it lends itself to free throw attempts. Obviously, if you go back up and score it, it's usually a, an inside shot, a dunk, a foul, an and one. So, uh, there it's a big part of the game and something that we want to take away from our opponent and uh, be able to get those coveted second shots on our end. And how, how do you strike a balance between transition defense and offensive rebounding? Like how do you, where, where do you kind of draw the line between how many guys you want to send to the boards without compromising your transition defense? Well, we've always done it one way. We sign, we send three, you know, there are times when you play three guards, or the past when we've had three a three guard lineup where you don't really get that third guy on the glass as much. But uh, we want to send three, uh, always two. And we want uh, two guys getting back. Uh, you have to have a balance. While those guys are offensive rebounding, you want them to be protected so that the ball can get stopped and uh, you can protect uh, the other rim on, on a breakout or uh, on a fast break. But the best teams that we play, you know, um, you have to be good at both. You can't give them those easy transition opportunities. And we still want to be uh, formidable on the offensive glass. Brian Peterson. Coach, uh, you mentioned Ben not starting. Is there any talk or – consideration to changing the lineup to get him into the starting group or is he playing the minutes you want off the bench yeah it you know so much of it is who finishes the game you know the actual quality minutes are the most important thing uh, I mean we start a starting lineup for a reason we feel like that gives us the best chance to uh, 
to be the best team we can be at the beginning of each half. The starting role is one that's coveted by all players. So it's something that they shoot for. Uh, I think every player wants to start. But uh, for right now, I, I like the way our rotation is. The guys that don't start the game are really important towards our success, which I just pointed to uh, a few minutes ago. And Ben, with his scoring punch, really complements uh, the guys that don't start. If you think about how Terrell Brown plays, uh, how Christian Coloco and Ira Lee, the strengths of them, Ben gives us some scoring punch and firepower uh, with that group. And uh, we like how that feels right now. But when a guy like Ben continues to develop, you know, it's first, let's give him more opportunity. And, uh, and then if, if it's in our best interest to start him, we can eventually go that direction. But he, uh, he has a big role right now, and I think he's headed in the right direction. Thank you. Bruce Pasco. Hey, Sean, along those lines, I was actually uh, curious about that too. And, and you almost could make a similar argument for Terrell um, starting, but it's, I was wondering if you've thought about that, at least with, with a smaller lineup or, or in, at any point or, and uh, you know, whether, you know, and whether with Dalen particularly, if, if part of what you're saying is you're starting Dalen because he brings you a little bit of length, but also some ball handling and as well, or how, how do you kind of break that down? Yeah, I mean, we start the group that we start because we feel like it, it's our best five combination of players. Uh, but on this year's team, one of our strengths has been, and uh, I have my fingers crossed, I hope it continues to be our depth, you know, each year at the red blue game and in a non COVID traditional year, I think you guys always point towards, you know, the depth of how it will build. Is it good? Who will play what position, who will start, you know, who will grow. And it just seems like every week past that red blue experience, it seems to work itself out and you're never quite as deep when you get to conference play as you were in October. Uh, some of it is injuries. Some of it is just level of play, confidence, uh, you know, young players kind of headed in either one direction or the other. But on this year's team, you know, it's really remained intact. Uh, our best performances have come with a variety of combinations of players. Our depth really, really shined through against Washington State. Keep in mind, that was our third game of the week, third Pac-12 game of the week. And you know, being up there in the Pacific Northwest, we were on, you know, day four of our trip. You get into a double overtime game against a good team, a team that has not lost, uh, playing with a lot of confidence at home, like Washington State was. You know, it's easy to cave in at some point, but part of why we were able to keep playing and fight through is, you know, we had four guards out there at times. Uh, we had bad foul trouble with our front line, but we have four of those guys. So, we never ran out of bodies to play. And uh, those different combinations uh, have gotten us through different segments of our season. And this week will be even a bigger test to that. You know, the talent level, uh, the personnel of USC, the talent level and the personnel of UCLA, uh, the teams that both have, the coaches of both programs, they really are going to test us. Uh, we're going to have to be at our best this week to have a chance to win either game really. Uh, and uh, we're gonna call on that depth that, that you guys are asking about quite a bit. Playing through foul trouble, playing through injuries, Jamal, you know, turning his ankle and us being able to rest him a little bit more in that game. Um, so that's a big part of what we're talking to our guys about. And, uh, you know, I hope the four guys that don't start can all play really well this week. We're gonna really need them to play well and, and we're gonna need our starting group to play well too. And is there, uh, with Terrell too, you have, like Ben, you play him a lot at the end in the crunch time uh, versus starting him. What's the reason for that? And, and I mean, do you, do you view him differently, uh, you know, kind of in crunch time that maybe, and maybe with his size, maybe don't need him as much in the beginning or what specifically about him puts him in that role? Well, Terrell's a very smart player. Uh, he's one of our most experienced guards, one of our most experienced players that we have and every week that goes by, 
that experience also translates to him being confident and experienced in our program as well. Uh, but, you know, when you have somebody who has the assist to turnover ratio that he has, uh, I don't have the numbers completely in front of me, but I think it's close to being, you know, plus 30 assists on the season and maybe five turnovers, maybe like 34, 33 to five. I mean, when you get into, you know, game 10, uh, we're uh, in the new year and we are in conference play and you got a guy out there who plays the guard position and has only five turnovers. You know, having him in at the end is a good thing. And and that really shined through as well against Washington State. He, he not only hit the three-point shot to win the game, but he had a great drive with his left hand that I think sent it into the first or second overtime. But he just he's sure of himself. Uh, he's also a very good on-ball defender. And uh, he can guard a point guard or an off-the-ball player. So we trust him. And uh, that's why he's in there at the end. But he's also in there throughout. I mean, he makes a lot of good plays uh, really the entire game. Thanks. Jason Shear. Hey, Coach. I was just wondering, James sometimes uh, struggles with his shooting, but, but tends to bring other things to the game. Can you just talk about maybe how when his shot isn't hitting, how else he's impacting the game? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, we talk to James a lot. You know, one thing that you learn about your players is kind of how they're wired. And, you know, James, number one, is a, a great competitor. Uh, no one ever questions his, you know, love of winning and, and playing everything for a score. In practice, uh, you know, every segment that we have, he's trying to win the segment. Uh, in games, uh, he takes on personal challenges. Uh, he wants his team to win. And he's willing to do a lot of different things to help us win. He also cares a lot about his own performance. And shooting is something that in the last year and a half, he's, he's put a ton of work in. And you see this all the time when a young guy like these guys that we're coaching really go the extra mile to you know, build their body up like Christian Coloco or, uh, you know, work on, a, on their free throw uh, like Christian Coloco or Jordan Brown or, in James's case, really working on his shooting, you know, they want it to translate right away, you know, and uh, it just takes time. But I believe James is capable of shooting a better percentage from all three levels. I think he can shoot better from the line. I think he can shoot better from the three-point line, and he can score and shoot a higher percentage from two. I think at, at from two, sometimes it's not a function of his ability to shoot as much as, you know, he'll take a few tough twos. You know, he'll challenge the big when sometimes he might be able to kick it to the corner or instead of taking it all the way to the rim, he can jump stop and shoot a, a pull up, which he's very good at. You know, same thing from the three point line, uh, you know, missing one or two, he stresses about it because I, I think he wants to make them so bad. But I really believe in him as a shooter, as long as his mind's in the right place. He continues to work like I've seen him work every day since I've been his coach. And he takes good shots. You want him to take good ones. Uh, the ball will go in. And uh, I think that's that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to the next couple of months. You know, his shooting percentage, when it rises, even if it's incrementally, you know, he makes us a much better team because we've, we've played through some stretches where he hasn't made them. Uh, but there's no doubt he's capable. And then with, uh, with Terrell, he's a guy when, when he was at Seattle, he was asked to do a lot more offensively and, and really carry the load there. Um, has a different role at, at Arizona. Is that something that is easy to evaluate or how do you kind of know that's going to be successful when a guy transfers schools and, and kind of changes roles? Yeah, you know, the one statistic that really stood out when Terrell played at, at Seattle, really there's, there's two, is his ability to take care of the ball. Like, Seattle was great at not turning it over. And he had the ball uh, in his hands um, a, ton of, a ton of minutes a year ago. And when you think about that right there, that's, that's one thing that's really translated from how he played at Seattle towards Arizona. You know, the other statistic that's really enormous for him is, I mean, he shot over 402-point shots. And for a guard to shoot that many twos, 
you know, again, I think it tells you his talent level, but really what makes him tick. Uh, you know, at this level, at the Pac-12, the difference of size and athleticism, there's not going to be that many twos available. And we have two bigs on the court. So the spacing at times will be different than the spacing he had at Seattle. But um, I do think that he can score more. Um, he doesn't have to get 20 a game for us. But, you know, taking those opportunities when they present themselves, we're encouraging him to do that. Um, like a lot of players on this year's team, it, it takes time to settle into a new role. It doesn't happen in game one or in the first couple of months of the season. It generally uh, takes into the months of January and February before a player really is sure of himself. I, I look, I'll, I'll use Stone Gettings as an example. You know, Stone practiced with us a year earlier, uh, but he lost all of December last year with a facial fracture. And when did he really come on? Late January, early February. That's when he was the most comfortable playing for us last year. So if you go through it with Terrell, knowing that he wasn't here this past summer, you know, I, I think the best is still yet to come for him as uh, he believes in himself at Arizona more, knows that we have tremendous confidence in him as a player. I think he has a little bit more of a scoring punch and we're going to call on that because we're, we're going to need him to be able to do that at certain times, but I can't say enough good things about Terrell. Uh, his performance this past weekend speaks for itself uh, at Washington and at Washington State, but he is a, a first-class guy, good student, great kid. Uh, he came highly recommended to us by his coaching staff at Seattle. Uh, obviously, Jason Terry is very familiar with his family, and but we're I'm just so happy that he's here because he gives us that leadership and that experience that we really needed desperately on this year's team. Uh, and he's, uh, he does his job. He practices hard every day and uh, he makes us a deeper, better team for sure. Jason Barr. Hi coach. I'd like to ask you about uh, Evan Mobley and what makes him so tough. But before I do that, I've got a question, kind of a funny question on the rules of the game. When you go into an overtime and a second overtime, I believe you get an extra timeout. Correct me if I'm wrong. And if that's the case, why does, I've always wanted to know this, why does a player not get an extra foul? So if you have four fouls going into overtime, shouldn't it be six that you foul out in? Or is that just the way it's always been done? No, that's a very good point. Um, you know, sometimes if you just step away and take a different perspective of basketball in general, um, and I believe I'm right about this. I'm, I may not be completely correct, but we're the one sport that, you know, penalizes our best players and, and puts, puts our best players in a position to be disqualified, you know, not by anything flagrant, but by, you know, committing five team fouls. Uh, so uh, to your point, um, I think, I think that's, that's something that, you know, can be discussed. I'm sure it has been discussed, you know, same thing with uh, the bonus structure, you know, in FIBA basketball, they have a unique bonus structure. So, you know, it resets, you know, by quarter, not, not by the half because they play four quarters. Uh, there's really a different level of strategy, you know, in terms of how you get to the bonus, how important it is to be in the bonus uh, because when it resets, you lose your advantage. Whereas in college basketball, you know, once you get into that bonus structure where the team's committed seven fouls, you know, you're forever going to the foul line until the end of the half, the end of the game. Uh, but, you know, playing overtime is, is long too. You know, it's a 40 minute game. It's a five minute overtime. You, you get into that 50 minute game like we were on Saturday and, you know, you're a long way from home. It really takes a lot of heart and fight to be able to finish like we did and I was very, very happy and proud of our guys. Uh, it was a game of resiliency. And, uh, you know, we'll call on that resiliency and that experience many more times as our year continues to march forward. Terrific. And uh, also uh, on Evan Mobley, the star freshman for USC, what makes him such a tough player? Well, obviously, I've seen Evan play, uh, you know, on the, on the travel team circuit prior to this summer and familiar with Isaiah, you know, his brother who played at SC last year. 
I also saw Evan uh, in USA basketball uh, in the tryouts in Colorado Springs for four days against obviously great players. Uh, Zeke Naji was there and he just, he has a unique ability of just being incredibly quick, like almost like a wing player who's a great athlete, light on his feet, quick to the ball, huge second jump, explosive, can run and, and move, but yet he's seven feet tall and he's very, very long. Uh, you know, DeAndre, DeAndre just, he also was one of those guys who was amazing with his agility and, but, you know, DeAndre is big, it's strong. He could kind of go through you. You know, right now, you know, Evan Mobley just, he always is going by you, around you, over you. You know, he just really calls on his length and his athleticism. But he's also a very skilled basketball player, as is his brother. Those, both of those guys can dribble, pass, shoot. Uh, they'll drive the ball. They play everywhere on the court. They're not just strictly low post big guys. And that's what makes USC so versatile. Uh, the other part of Evan Mobley is – He's a tremendous shot blocker. He, he goes and gets it. Uh, he makes it look easy, protects the basket. And when you look at USC on defense, you know, Evan Mobley is a big reason why they're so good defensively, especially guarding the two-point field goal. Uh, he just blocks shots, alters shots, impacts the game, protects the paint like good big guys do. So it's his defense and his offense, his versatility, but he's certainly one of the best players in college basketball. And, uh, you know, his brother is as well. Uh, his dad and his mom and dad, I'd be very proud of both those guys. There aren't many families walking onto a basketball court that look like that. They, uh, they're they both very good players. Bruce Pasco. John, along those lines, I know the Mobleys make the, they're obviously a big part of this, but I was just wondering what you think about what makes their defense tick. Uh, you know, they're, they've been really, really good defensively and obviously shot blocking. What, what, what else kind of makes that work for them? Well, you know, I don't know if there's a statistic that reveals this, but I think they could be the, the tallest team in college basketball. You know, they, they have, you know, Taj Eady, who plays the one who's six foot two. You know, you have Drew Peterson and Isaiah White, I would say six eight, six seven at the, at the wings. Uh, you know, Max Ogbong Polo, who we're familiar with. Uh, we recruited Max, who's a sophomore. Max is six foot eight wing player off the bench. And, uh, you know, even, even their subs, I mean, I, I go through the, the, their roster here. You know, their wings are big. Their point guard is six foot two. And then, you know, Chavez Goodwin, number one, you know, the transfer from Wofford, you know, he's got to be six foot nine. So, you know, the, the eight players that are playing in the game, you have one guy six foot two. You have two or three players that are between 6'10 and seven feet tall. And then you have the remaining three players that are six foot eight. You know, it's like that length. It helps you be rebounding team, protects the basket. It's tough to make shots over top of you. And, uh, and that's why USC, in my opinion, is an NCAA tournament team. Uh, I think they got a terrific roster. Uh, and, you know, Andy Enfield, he's an experienced, very good coach. So they mix in a 2-3 zone. It's not just man-to-man. -man. They do both. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have to be ready to be efficient got to take care of the ball. We got to create our own good shots. They're, they're not going to give you easy open looks. I think Ken Palm actually has a weighted uh, length calculation and they are number one, at least when I looked at it. Um, anyway, I was also wondering just uh, next week, and I know this is far ahead in, in these times to think a week ahead, but Oregon State's pausing. The game is on as of now with you guys on that Thursday, the 14th, but uh, who knows? And, and I was wondering, how do you how do you handle that? Or, you know, or, or do you even think do you guys as a staff even think about that or and how it might affect things or, you know, what's the impact? No, I mean, Bruce, for us, I mean, we really just have to operate one day at a time, because, as you know, things can change tomorrow uh, on game day between us or USC. So 
you know, we're just trying to encourage our players to follow the COVID protocols that we have, to work hard, to be smart, uh, to make sure that that they're being honest and, and we're communicating on and off the court with them right now. And, uh, and just kind of take it one step, one day at a time. All of a sudden, you get through uh, another week. You know, last week was a big week for us. I mean, being on the road for five days, playing two road games, uh, actually playing three Pac-12 games. So, you know, recovering from that now that we're back here at home and we're looking forward to uh, the games this week. I mean, we're playing against two very good teams, well-coached groups of players, uh, a lot of experience, especially on UCLA side. And, uh, you know, I think you guys know this, for us to win games this week, we're going to have to play really well. Uh, we're, we're not going to, you know, overcome our own bad play and leave these games with victories. These are very good teams. And uh, they're hard to score on. They both rebound well. They have good personnel. They run good offense. And it should be, uh, you know, two really good games. You know, a Pac-12, I, I look at the point guard position in the Pac-12, in all of the seasons that I've coached here. And there's been quite a few very good point guards that have played in this league, both for us and against our team. But every time that we've played a Pac-12 game, you know, whether it's McKinley Wright, Quad A Green, you know, Bonton at Washington State doesn't get nearly the enough, enough recognition to be a, such a terrific player. He was very, very good last year. He's just as good this year. He had a great game against us on Saturday. Now you have Taj, Edie. Um, you know, you just start going through each player on on our respective opponents. And, uh, you know, it's it's a really good conference. I think we would have had as many as seven teams in last year's NCAA tournament. I believe quite a few of us could have advanced. And when I look at this year's conference, uh, we have quite a few teams that, are going to be in the postseason that are, are going to be very good. And, and I think that are capable of winning this year's PAC 12. And I believe that USC and UCLA are more than capable of winning the regular season championship. So should be really great brand of basketball, uh, two big games. I know our players are excited and hopefully we're going to be ready. Well, I was wondering one thing about that too. If, if, and just down the road, like, would you be amenable to playing uh, a game that get, if, if a game got canceled on a Thursday, play it again on instead of Monday, like say Oregon State wanted you play on Monday, kind of like that Colorado game where you played that and then boom, you went on the road. I mean, is that something you kind of figure you can handle or, or will have to handle because of the way things are going? Or Yeah, you know, as long as it's safe for our players and what I mean by safe, not, not COVID, but, you know, you have to be careful and aware that you know, you start playing three games in a week multiple times. If you ever play back to back, you know, it's you, you have to keep their health and well-being uh, in the forefront of your mind physically as well. And and really mentally, you know, it's just Pac-12 playing Thursday and Saturdays. It's quite a task, uh, you know, to, to get ready for both games, to get through both games. You know, how you feel on Sunday you know, just there's not much you could do, even if you wanted to. And and as you go deeper into the season, and that becomes even more challenging. So as long as it doesn't put us in, in harm's way that in that fashion, we, we want to play games. Um, I think you know that. And we really have a non-conference game that we potentially could make up at some point. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a date. We don't have an opponent. I don't even know if it'll work out, but if it would be capable of working out, that's something that we would talk to the Pac-12 office about and, and maybe make happen, you know, at some point. We, we want to play our full allotment of games. So uh, I don't have a say-so in what date or dates that we would reschedule a Pac-12 game, but if we would be called upon to do that, that's something we would, we would certainly entertain. Or, may, or certainly maybe the week you played ASU, would that make the most sense? You know, that you have that right. ASU game coming up what a couple of weeks on a Thursday yep. and then you could play Saturday or something. Yeah. All right, thanks. All right, coach, thank you. That's all we have. Okay, thank you. All right, Ira, thank you for joining us. Um, go ahead and media with your question. Just go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question for Ira and we'll get to it. Justin Spears. Looks like you're first. Ira, um, 
what makes this year's team different than maybe some of the other teams that you played on in the past? Um, I mean, there's, I feel like every team I've been on here has had depth, but um, just guys, you know, we have a group of guys that are like really, really bought into like our, um, what we're trying to get accomplished. You know, no one has the ego of I want to go out and score 20 or 30 a game. You know, we all, we're all on the same page. I say that's the biggest, biggest difference. Ryan Kellapier, you're next. Yeah, you guys are one of the top teams in the country in offensive rebounding. I'm just curious why you think that is. Um, something we emphasize every single day. Um, you know, just having that dog mentality. And, um, you know, we kind of got away from that a little bit against Washington State. But um, this week, for sure, we'll be on it, especially going up against talented groups, the talented groups of UCLA and USC. And you say you emphasize it. Is that just you, you guys talk about it? I mean, do you do drills to improve? Um, we do drills. Uh, you know, coach says do what we do. And part of him saying that is we're, we're a tough-minded tough minded group. And, uh, you know, we always want to bring that, that mentality, like, wow, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a dogfight when we play these guys. So but that's what I mean by we So what does, like, an, an offensive rebounding drill consist of? Let's see. We have, we have five-bag rebounding. <laughs> Um, we have, I can't think of the name of the drill right now, but we have one where we go three on three and you got to try and get the rebound. And sometimes it turns into a little bit of a football fighting match, but you know, it gets us ready for the game. Brian Peterson, you're next. I, I, I can't help but notice, uh, uh, your Twitter feed, uh, right before, uh, coming on here. Um, is it, is it hard to stay focused? on basketball with, um, I know you spoke a lot about this during the summer with everything going on, hard to stay focused on basketball with the way the country's going. Is that remain the case? And how do you balance that as somebody who does keep themselves um, involved and interested in what's going on? Um, and it's, it's difficult, but uh, at the same time, you know, basketball is the game that I love. And it's, uh, you know, I got a job to do every day. So, you know, I'm always, obviously, going to come in and give 110 every single day. But when it comes to outside stuff, you know, I can't, I can't ignore it. I'm not just going to brush it to the side either. And, and as far as uh, the team itself, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, there's been some tremendous uh, performances from the bench lately with Benedict and with Terrell and, and as someone who has spent most of their career coming off the bench, um, what does it take to, to keep that energy going, knowing that you, you aren't in the starting lineup and that you don't know when you're entering the game? Um, no, that just, I think that, <clears throat> that comes from just within, you know, just having confidence in yourself, just knowing who you are. And uh, you can't let little things like not starting or playing as many minutes as somebody else, you can't let that really affect you. And I, I feel like I've, you know, I've kind of perfected that. And at the same time, I, you know, if, Shoot, like Ben. Ben had twenty four and eleven the other day. That's that's big time for him. You know, I'm always ruining my guys on like, hey, like even Azulis. Azulis, when he got into the starting line, I was like, hey, if you can give me a double double night, come on, you know, just stuff like that. So, and just the type of person that I am, I'm an encouraging person. You know, I care about my teammates. So the, off the bench doesn't really bother me like that. Thank you, uh, Justin Spears. Ira, you being an L.A. guy, I'm sure, you know, you've grown up around uh, the Mobley brothers. Uh, what do you think about this challenge and going against those guys this week? Mm -hmm. uh, shoot, I, I've known those dudes since they were little guys. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a great battle in there. They're both talented guys. Uh, obviously, Evan has the hype he has around him. And um, it's going to be a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge I've been waiting for. And uh, what makes Evan Mobley a guy who's considered to be a number one pick? Um, he's just like a, like a really unique talent. I mean, he's seven foot, but he moves like a guard. Um, he's just really skilled and he knows how to use his size. Then uh, obviously, you know, he'll, he'll put on muscle eventually as he gets older. But, um, yeah, I think that's, his, that's the biggest thing that stands out about him. He's, he's a seven footer that, that moves gracefully. And, uh, have you uh, played in any games, um, uh, in high school or on the AAU circuit with those guys? Um, well, actually, me and me and I, Isaiah, his, his brother, we, we actually play in middle school together, uh, I-10 Celtics. 
but uh, Evan, no, I never, I never really played against Evan. I always saw the videos. Um, I actually went to a couple of his games, but uh, I never actually got to play against him in high school. And then I, Isaiah, uh, uh, what do you like about just the progress he's made? And uh, do you have any memories of, of middle school and, and playing basketball with him? I mean, you know, he's always been the the tall, skinny kid that uh, wants to shoot the ball. So, you know, this summer actually worked out a couple times together this summer. So he, you know, he put on muscle. Um, he's starting to become more physical. At least that's what I saw from the film this past week. So, um, you know, it's just it's great to see him finally come into his own, and you know, he'll he'll continue to get better. Jason Shear. Yeah, hey, right. I was just wondering, do these games against the LA schools mean a little bit more to you? Um, yeah, but also I, I have to put too much thought into it. You know, I, I still approach it like any other game. But one, my dad played at USC, two, pretty much the whole team um, on both teams. So, you know, I, I take that into consideration sometimes. But like I said, I, I, I treat every game the same. You know, I don't you know, I don't care if you're my best friend, brother, cousin, whatever. I'm still going to attack you the same way. And then also this team seems to the team chemistry is is great. The team seems to legitimately like each other. Is that something did that click right away? Is that something you guys had to work on or how did that kind of come about? Um, no, it clicked right away. Um, I think. A lot of that comes from, you know, the senior leadership between me and Terrell. You know, we, we try our best to keep the guys together, especially with such a young group. Um, you know, you have to, you have to kind of, and plus also we're in a pandemic, you know, so we can't hang out as much as we usually want to. But no, nah, since day one, we all clicked, you know, just all, it's just a group of good dudes, man. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. Bruce Pasco. Hey, Ira, um, do you know, I, you were talking about the rotation a little bit. I mean, you've been around. Do you feel like this time of year, it seems like things kind of come together as far as guys knowing what they're doing? Do you, do you get the feeling with this team that you're there at this point or, or maybe a few more games or kind of where are you at as far as everybody knowing? Um, to be honest with you, I think we're sharp right now. You know, even if you just and watch our practices, you know, um, guys are in the right spot on defense. Um, guys know what they're doing. It's usually what happens when you get into Pac-12 play, you know, for, especially for freshmen, you know, they get they get, they get those non-conference games under their belt and uh, they get comfortable. And as I mean, you send um, Daylon, even Daylon's getting better on defense. Liz Azulis is starting to figure it out offense and defensive end. So, um, you know, I say right now we're sharp, but I'll, also, too, I think we have another level we can go up to as well. On, on a completely different note, I wanted to ask you uh, just – I think you're the one guy on the roster who arrived at Arizona here before any of this FBI stuff came on. And I was just kind of wondering, and I, therefore had no idea that there might even be a possibility of, of not playing in postseason. So I was wondering your reaction just to that decision last week that, that they wanted to self self impose. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you, it, it did hurt, you know, cause what we, I went to, I went to the tournament freshman year. We lost first round to Buffalo. Second year um, was a rough year for us. My third year here, Corona, and now this situation. So it was hard, but you know, just like I told the guys, we might as well go out with a bang. So try to win an every day in conference game. Yeah. We got nothing to lose. Do, well, does it, uh, does it change your thought that maybe you might come back next year? I mean, you do have that option now that, that, that you could come back. What, what do you think? I'll be quite honest with you, I haven't really put too much thought into that yet. But, you know, when Mark around, I'll, I'll sit down with my family and the coaching staff and see what what's best for me. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else for Ira? Any other questions? Ira, where are you, by the way? Um, I'm with home. that background. Yeah, what? no, I'm, I'm at home. I'm in my own apartment right now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had practice this morning, so I had to come home, take a little nap. All right, Ira, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, Ira.